Amen. Many said it would never happen. The last chapter had been written. But for a generation of readers, the excitement is beginning to build again. Addison, one of our creative learning graduates who has come back as a volunteer, told me the other day that she is so excited she can hardly stand it. Have you figured it out yet? It will open in London as a play on July 30th. And the next day it will be released in book form. Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. It is the eighth story in the Harry Potter canon. And I gotta tell you, it is hard to believe that it's been 20 years since a giant of a man came crashing through the door, stunning 11-year-old Harry Potter and his horribly heartless aunt, uncle, and cousin. The giant, Hagrid, had been sent by the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry to fetch young Harry. <coughs> He's not going, said his cruel Uncle Vernon. Hagrid, the shaggy giant, grunted, I'd like to see a great muggle like you stop him. A what? Harry asked. A muggle, said Hagrid. It's what we call non-magic folk like them, and it's your bad luck you grew up in a family of the biggest muggles I ever laid eyes on. We swore when we took him in that we put a stop to that rubbish, said Uncle Vernon. Swore we'd stamp it out of him. Wizard indeed. You knew, said Harry. You knew I am a wizard. No shrieked his aunt. No, of course we knew. How could you not be my dratted sister being what she was? I was the only one who saw her for what she was, a freak. What Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vernon didn't realize is that in the world of Harry Potter, they, not Harry and his fellow witches and wizards, are the freaks. There's nothing evil about having magical powers in these wonderful fantasies by J.K. Rowling. And a great many characters use their magic to do magnificently moral and virtuous things. The muggles are the sad and sickly and silly ones in these stories. If, 20 years in, you still think Hogwarts is some kind of infection, you may well be a puppet. <laughs> Likewise, if you're mystified what a parcel mouth is, or a Nimbus 2000, there is a cure, though. Pick up the first book, The Sorcerer's Stone, today. You've got about two months to catch up before the new book arrives. <clears throat> now, some flavors of church-going Christians bust on these people. According to them, it is wrong to paint a positive picture of wizards and witches, wrong to be soft on magical spells, wrong to make Harry a hero. Harry Potter is not evil. He doesn't worship Satan. He doesn't abuse innocence, subvert goodness, or undermine morality. To say that these books encourage witchcraft is to say the books about UFOs encourage consorting with aliens. It's a fantasy world for Pete's sake. Besides, once you get your first taste of magic, you will never want to be a muggle again. Take a simple game like wizard chess, which is exactly like muggle chess, except the figures are alive which makes it a whole lot more fun. We're talking about a life-changing leap here, one from which there's no jumping back. Once you enter the world of magic, it is muggle no more. And no, it may come as a surprise. 
Much the same transformation occurred when the Holy Spirit made a Pentecost day visit to Jerusalem's muggles just a few days after Jesus was lifted up from Mount Olivet. What now? Wondered these heaven-gazing head scratchers. Jesus had promised them power from on high. Power that would enable them to go to the ends of the earth to continue his miracles, to preach the gospel, to face persecution. Jesus predicted the coming of a power so great that a sorcerer later in the book of Acts would offer to buy the power of this magic from Peter. But first they had to wait. And so those disciples devoted themselves to prayer. But they didn't have to wait too long. On Pentecost, the Holy Spirit arrived, busting into their lives like Hagrid, the shaggy giant, splittering a front door. The Spirit rushed over them with the sound of a violent wind, danced on their heads like divided tongues of fire, filled them with power and the ability to speak in a variety of languages. In a flash, the followers of Jesus were muggles no more. And the church exploded as an amazing, astonishing, perplexing, and utterly magical movement. But hold on a second. Is it appropriate to call the power of the Holy Spirit magic? Was it magic that caused the gaggle of Galileans to begin speaking the language of the Parthenons, Medes, Elamites, Egyptians, Cretans, Arabs? Was it magic that inspired Peter to overcome his cowardice and address thousands of people with a powerful promise of salvation for, as he said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord? No, not exactly. It wasn't magic in the Harry Potter style, but it still seems magical, does it not? And maybe this isn't such a bad thing. The Spirit's work in the church and in us is magical. If by magic you mean the miracle of being able to transcend our humanness, of being able to reach the unreachable, of having peace in the midst of the storm, of having concern for the least of our sisters and brothers, of being set free from the power of addiction through the grace of God, of finding your life by losing it, of welcoming refugees as fellow children of God. When the Spirit comes, we are transformed by a transcendent power. But far too many of us still act like we are non-transcendent muggles, failing to take our spiritual lives to another level of daily reliance upon the one who brings power and enabling us beyond our own human resources. I'm afraid that we are some of us who don't fully accept the fact that, that God has made us already muggles no more. So how does Pentecost move us from being muggle people to miracle people. For starters, the Holy Spirit gives us power to go beyond our human limitations. No, we're not wizards with well-trained, message-carrying owls and magic wands that enable us to conjure up courage. But we do have a spirit in us and among us that inspires and enables us to carry our faith across barriers of culture, race, and nationality, and, and to take a stand for the life-giving hope that burns within us. The Spirit also calls us to move to a new level of daily reliance on God, one that will give us deeper serenity in the midst of our personal storms. It will also give us greater concern for the welfare of persons being tattered by tempests around us. Only 
Only through reliance on the presence and power of God can we face what Harry Potter called dementors, horrid, hooded apparitions that breed in the darkest, filthiest places, create decay, despair, and drain peace, hope, and happiness out of any human who comes too close to them. But we already know about dementors, don't we? Perhaps they're a painful mental state such as depression. Maybe they're the anguish a neighbor feels as she watches her husband deteriorate through Alzheimer's. Maybe they're the grief a friend is suffering after the sudden death of a child. Maybe they're the hopelessness that a single mother is feeling as she struggles to make ends meet for her children. We all have our dementors. And we all need God to keep us from being destroyed by them. And maybe, just maybe, God is giving us the resources we need to reach out to our neighbors, our friends, our families, and to drive the mentors from their doors. With the miraculous, our God is amazingly generous. Peter was given the gift of courage so he could preach to those people in Jerusalem. The apostles were offered the gift of languages so they could speak to visitors from every nation. God gives us what we need. And when we accept God's gifts, God then sends us out to do great and glorious things in the world. If we rely on these God-given gifts, we will leave motherhood behind for good and claim our status as miracle people. No longer muggles, hear it now, but now ordinary folk full of extraordinary God-given power, as fantastic as Harry and Hagrid, and as faithful as Peter and the apostles. And we will never, we will never want to be non-magical people again. Amen.